Our Addiction to Inflation and Federalism by Tom Wilson. Can you break an addiction that is taking away your individual liberty? Do you have the courage to admit that you have become addicted to a way of life that is killing our nation? This message is oriented to the subject of our having become addicted to a false economy and artificial economic order that is destined to collapse. How we got into this present predicament will be revealed, and then what we have to do to get ourselves out of it. Just what is it we're looking at in this thing we call our inflated national economy? There are a number of conditions that will produce a high-level economy. How about a wartime economy? Can we sacrifice the human life, human emotions, and waste the materials from our resources to afford such an economy? Well, of course not. That's unthinkable. But as we zoom in close to the analysis of economy, we find that anything that forces unnatural inflation of economy will require these same sacrifices, although they may not be seen so easily from the surface. These sacrifices will be made sooner or later. There is no such thing as something for nothing unless you can count promises as something. It's all over the news these days how our federal government is doing many things to boost up, shim up, jack up, shore up, and regulate our economy, stabilize it, they say. Only today, another remedy was announced. The national debt limit was raised by another $47 billion. And these same fixers are the ones who pay agriculturalists for not growing things, but will fine and imprison them if they do. Throughout all segments of our national economy, it has become painfully clear that only a very fine line is left between where we are now and totalitarian control, or to express it in plain language, a dictatorship. Our addiction to an economy falsified by promises has led us into trading in all that we have for nothing all of our constitutional liberties for slavery. Do you think this is not true? Then look around very cautiously, slowly, and thoughtfully. But don't try to run. You're in a well-concealed trap, a trap that we paid for and built with our own hands. We didn't recognize it because we were told the pieces were for building a more secure way of life, future benefits, and all that sort of thing. Remember? We have been promised all sorts of controls and regulations that would help us to have a more sound and prosperous competitive free enterprise system, a system that built us into the world's greatest industrial nation. Why all of a sudden did our wonderful system that worked so well need so much fixing? Because somebody wants to take it away from us. That's why. And they have all but done it. So this is a thumbnail summary of our national economic outlook, the shape it's in now, and how it got that way. The research that went into preparation of this message and the previous message titled Common Sense and Your Last Chance to Use It has uncovered something very significant. There is some kind of disorder in almost every facet of the national scene these days. This is no surprise because many of these disorders receive national publicity, such things as energy shortages, school busing, high taxes, red tape, bureaucracy, and so forth. Now, you are quite familiar with the many areas of unrest and controversy, but the shocking discovery came when it was found that without exception, all of these problems trace back to only one principal source, a conspiracy to take over our nation. There seems to be no way to prepare any message dealing with national problems that can be isolated from this underlying common source of our many problems. You may be sick and tired of hearing about our national economy because far too much is being said about it these days by people who don't seem to know much about economy. They have so much disagreement about the cause and remedy. But here we're going to deal with the side of our national economy that the experts don't seem to understand. This is your side of the economy, where the real philosophy of sound economy begins. The experts tend to forget that the big economy consists of the sum of millions of smaller pieces. That's us. 
We're not just a mass of peasants or slave workers. That is, not quite yet. We are individuals that use the power of our minds and the toil of our hands to produce the products in our economy, and we have the purchasing power that makes our wares and money circulate. When the experts start thinking only in terms of billions and forget where the many pieces that make their billions come from, we're in a lot of trouble through no fault of our own. Experts on affairs of national economy are employed as advisors in our federal governing system, and these advisors, with the power of federal regulation and federal control to back them up, have succeeded over a period of years in generating a national economic structure that is inflated, unsound, unstable, unbalanced, and unnatural. This has been done a little at a time to keep us unaware of their plot. We have become slaves to federal regulation and at the same time have become hooked on addicted to the loose money, high times, circus atmosphere of an inflated economy. The younger generation, now of voting age and perhaps a little older, has grown up in a false economy and they do not realize that they are addicts. Many of us who are from a little farther back know that our economy is a fake, but have become addicted to the various benefits either handed out or promised for some day later and fear to raise a finger in protest for fear of losing our federal fix. This leads to the source of our problem. We are the victims of a deliberate plan, conspiracy if you prefer, to collapse our economy and force our submission to a new order of government under a so-called new constitution, a totalitarian dictatorship police state governing system that takes away our remaining freedom and makes us slaves. It will not be possible to properly cover the subject of our national economy without showing the workings of our economy as related to the plot to overthrow our government. So let's explore the causes and cure of this relation first, then go into economic structure. It is after defeat that we rise up to become strong, and it is after victory that we begin another fall. Only after we have had something and then lost it are we able to assess a true value to what we had. Thus, by our own experiences and through the experiences of others, we learn to become more conscious of the value of what we possess instead of taking all things for granted. The most precious possession of we the people in our free nation is our freedom of choice within the laws of the land, our freedom of choice guaranteed by the Constitution drawn up by our founding fathers. We have already lost much of this guaranteed freedom of choice, and this loss has not been through any fault in our original constitutional structure. Our freedom is being taken away a little at a time by unconstitutional federal laws and unconstitutional federal controls and policies. This has been accomplished through subversive, behind-the-scenes manipulation of our federal system, manipulation which bypasses our representative rights in government. It takes an awful lot of gall and an awful lot of evil subversion to contaminate our federal structure with unconstitutional deviations like those which have brought on our present loss of popular representation. This has been accomplished in a variety of ways, but the manipulations have been made possible through public indoctrination to an illusion that federal control and federal power hold all the answers to all our problems. Manipulated control of our mass communications media has made this indoctrination possible and very effective. Just listen to the national newscast for a few times and you will begin to realize that what you are hearing most is indoctrination, that federal control, federal power, federal policy, and federal wealth hold all the answers to all our problems, domestic and international. All of the subversive manipulation to overthrow our system ties in directly with our national economic structure. Most of the influence that results in constitutional deviation comes about through pressure upon and within our federal system, pressure by highly centralized big money and corporate interests, backed with the manpower and the money to make their interests heard and favored over and above our popular public opinion. This overriding of public opinion is not possible without deviating away from our original constitutional system. 
manipulation of unconstitutional legislation into federal law has been taking away the voice of the people in our representative system and giving power of decision directly to federal authority. Much of this shift in power to federal authority has been manipulated into federal law under the guise of need for stronger federal power that bypasses acts of Congress during emergencies. This might seem to be logical, except that now the federal government has the legal authority to declare some kind of a national emergency at any time and take over all power of control, whether a real emergency exists or not. The lust for power that is behind federal manipulation is the same lust for power that has gained control of our national economy because the power is in the hands of the same people. By disregarding long-standing antitrust laws, the major producers of materials and energy for our nation have become highly centralized in both operations and in management. Our popular preferences are receiving less and less recognition, whether we are looking toward the federal government or looking for food of our preference in the supermarket. Over-centralization in both government and industry has placed our freedom of choice within the limits of what those in control give us to choose from, and even this limited choice is influenced by the pressure of national advertising. We don't have anywhere near the range of choice that we should have in a national economy the size of ours, whether we are looking at automobiles, foodstuffs, clothing, appliances, or who's running for office. This is a very unhealthy economic catastrophe because it reflects the collapsing of independent business, competitive free enterprise, and the natural economic system of supply and demand. So we have all but lost local independence of government and local independence in production of supplies necessary for survival and for defense. From our side, the we the people side of our national scene, this predicament is precarious. It makes us quite vulnerable to internal collapse, internal overthrow, or external overthrow of our nation. This is indeed a sad day in the history of our beloved United States of America. We are, generally speaking, a nation of nice people, all but a few bums, and thank goodness we still have the right to choose either way of life within the law of the land. But we are also, generally speaking, a nation of trusting souls, trusting souls that have been sold on the auction block of federalism by the very people who have made the loudest proclamations about representing our best interests. No, we can't blame our founding fathers or their constitutional representative system. We grew into the world's greatest nation under their system by respecting and not deviating away from it. Let's put the blame exactly where it belongs, on the power-crazed manipulators who have infiltrated our governing system and our national economy. Our personal guilt lies only in being too trusting to the extent of being suckers to their evil schemes. So what is our outlook in this great big inflated economy with a deviated federal government? Do we survive? Can our children look forward to a life of prosperity and contentment? or a life of slavery? Will there be a United States of America, or will we become a slave unit under a totalitarian one-world government? Will our efforts to achieve a lasting civilization degenerate into a return to the Dark Ages? The right answers to these questions can't be manipulated, subsidized, legislated, or regulated by federal controls. The answers we must have can come only from the hearts of we the people, not just words, but spirit and action, mass action, public opinion backed by the real power that makes our nation go, we the people. We survive only through knowledge of truth and the application of this knowledge in our living. Deviation from the truth into ways not compatible with the laws of nature means an early termination of our efforts to survive. Knowledge in the mind, like knowledge in a book, has no value whatsoever unless it is put to work. But the mere transfer of knowledge from one individual to another is knowledge at work, and it will, if circulated, reach a recipient that will turn it into dynamic action. Hear a word of caution. It is important that the knowledge of truth be the truth as you feel it, 
Not all knowledge is truthful, and we have fallen victim to much indoctrination that is presented as the whole truth when it is neither truthful or accurate, but instead it contains only bits and pieces of the truth to give us the illusion that the, it is the whole truth. You have a good mind, a logical mind, and possess the power to make important decisions that mean life or death. This is not an occasional decision, but one you face perhaps many times each day. If you drive a car or just walk across the street, you make such decisions. Your desire to survive is well supported by your ability to survive through use of your natural and cultivated senses of logic and judgment. So if you will open your mind to face the facts you already know and open your eyes to really see what you have been looking at every day, your common sense may scare you half to death, and well it should. You will soon realize that our problem is one that is much too big to be solved by expert economists or by a federal government. The only real power of a nation is in its people, and the real power in an economy is in its people. The only power of a government lies in the willingness of the people to back it up with their power, the power in their minds and their hands that make it go, either in ways that are good or in ways that are bad. So the real power is ours, and that means yours too. Knowledge of the truth carries with it an obligation to share it wherever it is welcome. We have been misled, have fallen victim to the oldest form of deception known to the human species, the promise of something for nothing. There is no such thing, and we all know it, but have a weakness for its temptation. Those who would take away all that we have then lead us into their servitude, always do it with promises. We already know, if we listen to our own judgment, that anything our leaders can give us must first be taken away from us. We let them manipulate legislation to make our contributions compulsory. Next they start throwing and giving our contributions away, and there's not much left to give back to us except more promises. Oh, they keep giving us something, all right. They go borrow. Then we owe that back to them, plus interest. Economic experts call this high-sounding terms like national debt and uh, deficit spending. You might call it grand larceny, embezzlement, or a protection racket that takes and takes but doesn't give anything back. So you see, the federal government can't solve our problem. Promises haven't done it, and promises can't do it. Whether we like it or not, the decisions that determine our future and the future of our children are down to our level, right where our founding fathers said it should always be 200 years ago. There is no earthly power greater than that of public opinion. This is the power that makes leaders of nations follow the will of the people instead of the people following the will of a dictator. The choice is ours as individuals and as a populace. Individuals can do only so much working alone, but individuals form our populace, and the populace can do it. People power grows as individuals wake up and get up off of those idle promises, start making similar sounds and pointing in a common direction. Then come the individuals who want the glory of leadership and climb onto the bandwagon of public opinion. This starts the cycle that inevitably leads to corruption all over again. But it may be a long cycle with several generations of prosperous, contented living. And who knows, maybe we will actually discover real civilization and prosper in peace and contentment forever. No, we can't allow ourselves the luxury of losing ourselves in probabilities, not until the job at hand is completed to our popular satisfaction. There is more to be done than we have ever had to do before. But there are more of us to do it than ever before. Thanks to a handful of very aware patriots, the job of repairing our bruised and battered nation and its economy has already begun. Success or failure is in our hands, we the people. Now must come the rise of united opinion, united concern, united effort, and united spirit. We are all in this together. Our efforts and opinions must not become dissected into social and economic categories, ethnic groups, or minorities. This time we're all standing at the crossroads, 
And the only issue is do we survive or don't we survive? We all choose together or we all lose together. Now let's establish a few well-recognized facts relative to our economy. We do have an inflated economy with prices and taxes to match. We do have federal regulations that affect the level of our economy through subsidies and price fixing. We have no choice other than to base our workable sense of values, whether we like it or not, on the level of our inflated, federally influenced, or federally manipulated economy. Therefore, our economy, our way of life, and our personal sense of values are all closely related to federal economic policies and a multiplicity of federal controls. It is also well established that our present economy is very unstable and that while high-level inflation means prosperity for some of us, it is unbalanced and works a hardship on the rest of us. Next, let's examine, one at a time, 12 different ingredients that must surely be included in any free nation's economic society if the economy is to be stable and survive. Economy ingredient number one, a realistic public and individual sense of values for material things. This sounds so simple, and yet it is quite important and even complex. Normally, in a self-balancing supply and demand economy, our personal sense of values regulates the economic level because the level has to assume a position somewhere near our average evaluation of things. So in a natural economy, it is the people who establish the level. We are surrounded by such quantity and variety of man-made things in our daily lives that we are inclined to take their existence for granted without realizing their actual value to us and the part they play in our economy. So often we take a real good look at something just twice during the period of our ownership. The first time is when we take possession of it, and the second time is just before we throw it away. If it's an expendable type item, we don't bother to take the second look, but we should to see if there isn't some further usage that can be served through some reclamation process. Somehow this brings up a news item that originated somewhere way down in Texas. It was to the effect that one of the prisoners in a jail cell would occasionally unscrew the light bulb in his cell, break the bulb, and eat the glass. One day after such an episode, the jailer went into the cell, picked up the broken bulb metal screw base from the floor, held it up to the prisoner, and said, Why, looky here, you've done throwed away the best part. But be that as it may, you might find it enlightening to look around at some item you normally take for granted. Look at it as if seeing it for the first time. Determine what it really is good for, if anything. Where did the materials originate? How is it made? Who made it? And what part did or does it play in our economy? This may sound like a silly sort of thing to do, but it will, in a very small way, broaden the understanding of what an economy really is. All that we see has some kind of value relative to our economy, whether it is a diamond watch or a bag of garbage. Let's take, for example, an ordinary can of beans. The beans are valuable if you're hungry. If you're starving, you would fight for a can of beans. The beans grow by processes known only to nature, but which are assisted by people. They are harvested, cooked, canned, labeled, transported, and merchandised by people with the assistance of machines built by people. The can originates with iron ore, which is smelted, refined, and rolled into sheet steel in a steel mill, built and operated by people. The steel is then tin-plated and formed into cans by people and the machines in a can factory. Then the can is filled, sealed, labeled, and boxed in a food cannery. The label and box originated in a forest and came through a paper mill, and then printers put on a description of the contents. So a lot of people and equipment are involved in a can of beans. Commercial artists, tool makers, glue factories, trucks and drivers, and the list goes on and on. So we eat the beans and throw away the can and the label. 
Why? Because we're wasteful. That's why. The can is recyclable, and so is the label if removed. It can be made into paper again, or it can be burned as a fuel. Well, so much for a can of beans. You might, however, find it interesting, educational, and rewarding to ponder the value of things. The price stamp on an item doesn't really describe very well the role an item has played on its trip down through our economy on its way to the consumer. Our city dumps and disposal landfills are turning into mountains of material that should have found further usage. Overpackaging contributes to waste that will eventually come to an end, but it would be much better, in fact it is absolutely essential, that we find the right answers to our waste problems. If we wait for nature to put an end to our wasteful ways, it will, but it will be of no help to us at all by then. When economy is perverted through monopolistic control or through federal regulatory controls, it loses natural balance and begins to swing up and down as the controls are manipulated. Those doing the controlling make multiple fortunes this way, at public expense. Their gain somehow always turns out to be our loss in one way or another. A forced economy that is not self-regulating is a poor risk for a long survival. Economy ingredient number two, a realistic public and individual sense of values for labor and time. It is our labor and our time through the use of our minds and hands that supply the actual motive force of our economy and make it work. Here again we are faced with values that should be self-regulating in a self-balancing economy. The value of labor and time must be based on the ability and functional productivity of individuals, not on an average value like applies to materials. Wage contracts and federal wage fixing represent monopolistic setting of values that warp the economic balance and let some thrive while others perish. Forced control limits incentive and alters individual productivity. We will always have our responsibility to the old, the ill, the indigent, and the incapable. Let's always take care of them generously through local and state aid, not through federal agencies where administrative costs are unaccountable. Let's put the money where the need is, all of it. In our constitutional democratic republic, we are free within the laws of the land to spend our labor and time working toward fulfillment of personal hopes and dreams. Slaves work only to meet the demands of dictators. Slavery is the highest order of fixing a value on labor and time. Economy ingredient number three. A monetary system based on reserves of materials valued by everyone, including international trade, gold, silver, and so forth, instead of paper money backed only by a promise of the Federal Reserve System that it is legal tender for all debts, public and private. The Federal Reserve System is a privately owned corporation separate from the government and has refused to submit to audit for more than 60 years. The Reserve System, besides controlling our currency, has the ability to cause inflation and depression. Are you satisfied that they always conduct their manipulations for our best interests as well as theirs? If so, why do they refuse to be audited by Congress or anyone else outside the system? Economy ingredient number four. Local production and local stockpiling for defense and supply purposes, to all extent possible and practical, materials and equipment needed to support industry, defense, and local economy. This means food, clothing, appliances, transportation equipment, farm machinery, building materials, and energy. Now why is this important? Well, first of all, it provides a means of security and means of survival that we don't have now. It gives us a strong national defense by making us self-sufficient and strong all over. Local sufficiency means that we would have to be conquered city by city and town by town. 
As it is now, we are almost without national defense because we are dependent on long supply lines for many of the essentials for survival. We have become so dependent on large quantities of energy that cutting off our energy supply alone would force us into submission within a matter of hours. Over-centralization of supply for our essentials is more than just something to think about. It is something that we must do something about. We need more security than afforded by an array of military installations. We need local sufficiency. A few years ago, one of the radio stations in a large city was encouraging a clean-up, fix-up, paint-up campaign as a community public service. One enthusiastic lady called up the station and said, Oh, this is such a wonderful idea. But when do we start? Well, our job can't wait until somebody else go. If you believe that any of the things pointed out in this message need working on, for goodness sakes, get started now. Tell your friends, wife, kids, boss, anybody that might help. But for the time being, forget about your congressmen. They are addicted to the manipulated federalism and will not change their habits unless public opinion forces them to get back to their job, their duty in representing us instead of the manipulators. Another consideration for local independence besides defense ability is the generation of local pride of accomplishment and better local control of your way of life. You are close to your survival necessities and know where you stand and how to plan. You are part of a community and can see where you fit in and can appreciate the contributions made by your associates. Economy ingredient number five. Planning and production of products designed and engineered to have a long, useful service life, be maintainable and serviceable. No one has to tell you that this era of rapid obsolescence we're in is wasteful and impractical. It jacks up an already inflated economy, an economy already suffering technological breakdown. Many of the things we buy are over-advertised and we are often misled into believing that here at last is just what we need. So we borrow money and buy, buy a lemon. It hardly slows down on its trip from the factory to the junkyard. What a waste of material, what a waste of man's time, and what a waste of the hopes and dreams of the one who pays the bill plus taxes. No, this sort of thing does not make a stable, long-term economy, and we all know it. If we manage to hang on to an item long enough and are blessed with good fortune, we may get the bugs out of it just in time for it to become obsolete and parts and service almost impossible to obtain. We hear them say, Who wants to fool with that old thing? Let's make him trade it in on a new one. No, it's not just automobiles implicated here, but many of the things we have come to regard as necessities. It may even apply to a few wedding rings. The recycling of residual materials at the end of a product life should be planned while the product is still in the drawing board's design stage, because at this stage the method of fabrication can be flexed to facilitate methods of material separation that are most economical in the reclamation process. Much valuable material is lost if the product is burned and compressed. Also, reduction by burning releases many invisible but very undesirable contaminants into our atmosphere. Economy ingredient number six. A strong spirit of competitive free enterprise. The better product for less money spirit. The old better mousetrap concept. In a natural economy, products must win favor by their own merit of value or they die on the vine, so to speak. In our present economy, our sense of values are likely to be dulled by the atmosphere of loose money and the mountains of merchandise. When times stay too high too long, we tend to become careless in our evaluation of things. We are inclined to think, so why not give it a try? If it's no good, I'll throw it away and get a better one. This sort of attitude, together with high-pressure advertising, causes massive circulation of low-quality merchandise. It circulates a lot of money, but it is a very wasteful kind of economy, and it does not inspire producers of merchandise to keep upgrading their quality. Keen competition is the best incentive to produce top quality. 
Centralization in business, mergers, monopolies, and so forth destroys competitive free enterprise and results in a manipulated economy that offers less quality for the consumer's dollar. Big, monopolistic businesses have the money to push national advertising, and they know as long as times are high, those suckers out there will buy anything if the advertising is pushed hard enough. But this imposes an unfair hardship on persons forced to live on lower and fixed incomes. These dear souls are forced to value their dollars in terms of availability, but their dollars will not buy good quality merchandise. This is just one of the many sad, unjust consequences of a runaway, inflated economy. But there are remedies for this unbalance, and we see them applied every so often. People on Social Security complain loud enough and long enough until Federal action increases their payments and increases withholding taxes. Those under collective bargaining go on strike and negotiate new higher wage contracts. Then the Federal Government raises the minimum wage scale to take care of all the rest of us. See, the economists have it all figured out, don't they? Well, don't they? No. Expletive deleted, no. These remedies are just like putting a clean bandage over an unclean sore. It may look better all wrapped up in white, but underneath the infection keeps on spreading. All of these stopgap economic band-aids give short-term relief, but very quickly the effect comes full circle. Taxes go up, then prices go up, and we're right back where we were, except the economy is inflated more and our stability is weaker than ever. You may say, why, these Federal economists are a stupid bunch of jerks. Why, even my kids in middle school could do better than that. Sure they could. The real top-level financial brains behind this whole inflation mess know exactly what they're doing. Yes, they do. Believe it or not, our economy is doomed to collapse and it has been deliberately planned that way by the subversive infiltrators in our Federal system who are overthrowing our government right now from inside the top levels. We now have more than a one-generation span of citizens who have known high times and inflationary values all of their lives. These dear younger people have become so completely addicted to this false economy they have grown up in that when the crash comes, they will turn to anything that promises to give them a fix. They will blindly accept a new order of government with very little questioning if it promises relief from their suffering. This is the true significance of lowering the voting age. These dear youngsters have grown up during a time when Federalism has been promoted into the focal point of national attention and now all eyes and ears are turned to the Federal level as though it is the source of all things necessary to our life and happiness. Many people nowadays act as though they believe the works of nature were created by our government and are brought to us through the courtesy of Federal control and generosity. We may celebrate our 200th national birthday as a free nation, or we may not. Only the top manipulators control the timing of their totalitarian takeover. It is easy to see that it could be manipulated at any time now. They are all set up with the Federal districts, Federal buildings, offices, computers, and two and a half million Federal employees. Do you think this sounds too far out to be true? All right, then take a look at the white page listings in any fair-sized city telephone directory. First, look at the listings for local city government offices. Then look at the listings for state offices. Then turn to the listings under United States government offices. You will very likely find that there are more Federal listings than those of the local and state offices all added together. Now you can begin to see how they are all set up to wipe out and replace our existing local authority any time they are ready, and now you can see how the two and one-half million Federal employees fit into the picture. By the way, do you know how many two and one-half million are? Well, you have seen crowds of about 1,000 people, so count to two and one-half million by thousands, just to do it quickly. 
Are you through counting yet? Well, we've got to keep moving along, but you might like to finish that count later. Sure, we're a big nation, but that big? Hmm. Economy Ingredient Number 7 An economy free from excessive taxes, oppressive regulations, red tape, and federal subsidies. Regulations hit small, independent business harder than big centralized, monopolistic business. Increasing regulation is killing much small business that does not want to work with government contracts and the fat subsidies that go along with them. Big business can handle the extra red tape because the cost of processing is either compensated for by federal subsidies or passed through to us consumers. In either case, we end up paying the cost while small business is being squeezed out. Ask any independent free enterprise businessman. He'll tell you how it is. Economy Ingredient Number 8 An educational system that prepares the graduate for a sure-footed role in the economic society he intends to spend his life in, one which turns out students with authority and the confidence of know-how among the complexities of the society he is entering. Generally speaking, the educational background of today is falling far short of turning out students with the necessary authority and command of the actual needs for firm placement in the complex society they're entering. Here again we find the effect of deliberate manipulation to gain control of our nation and enslave its people. This manipulation is carried out mostly through philanthropic foundations which award financial grants to colleges and universities that offer courses of study favoring the liberal arts and courses dealing with social, economic, and governing systems which are slanted toward the future order of society planned for us by the manipulators. The manipulators are using our educational system to indoctrinate young minds to fit into their schemes. This is deviating and diluting the education of our youth in the preparation for a productive role in our economy. Never before have we had such an urgent need for youthful ingenuity. We have a dire need for technical upgrading and technical turnaround in many areas of our present technological way of life. We have the basic know-how to do many things better and more efficiently than we are now doing, but we need the mental power of well-educated, not indoctrinated youth to carry out these essential works. Yes, we need all the people our schools can turn out, but we need people who have something more in line with our actual needs instead of what is referred to these days as a, quote, higher education. Economy Ingredient Number 9 A self-regulating economy based on profit and on supply and demand instead of one controlled by price fixing and subsidies. The supply and demand way is nature's way. It is hard, cold, and cruel, but just. It has a sweet and gentle side, too, just like nature. The supply and demand way doesn't fool around and let things get all out of balance like people are inclined to do. It doesn't let hopes and dreams keep building and promising where there is no foundation for hope. It is quick and accurate. It does just fine without being controlled by man-made regulations. Enough said. Economy Ingredient Number 10 An economic system proportioned within the budget of natural supply not upon squandering more than can be produced, replaced, or recycled. In this area, we have gone off the deep end, and now we are about to panic as we begin to see a bitter end to our promiscuity. Our worst case large-scale offense in this area is overspending in our demand for energy. Not enough attention has been given to upgrading the efficient use of energy. We have been encouraged to use energy like it was going out of style, and what do you know, it's just about to do that very thing. Many of us have not been as penny-wise about operating costs as we should have been because of our high times loose money economic level, so the producers of energy-consuming devices have not been forced to concentrate on the efficiency of operation of their products. Why should they worry if we don't? Because we pay the bill for operating costs anyway. This leaves them free to specialize on appealing sales features like style, luxury, comfort, and social status of ownership. In other words, the sucker bait features. The principal offenders in the wasteful use of energy are automobiles, heating plants, and cooling systems. 
Internal combustion engines are well established as a dependable means for converting fuel into mechanical power, but their conversion efficiency is downright poor. Gasoline has for many years been accepted as a dependable fuel for engines, but here again we find elements contributing to waste. Some of the characteristics that make gasoline dependable and easy to use also make it wasteful. We already know how to use energy more efficiently than we are now doing, but the improvements will not be made until the condition of our economy forces manufacturers to apply them to their products. Competition and conservative spending can do more to conserve energy than all of the controls and regulations that can be applied. The technology developed around space exploration contains many improvements that are applicable to industrial upgrading. Don't you suppose our universities ought to be turning out more graduates trained and dedicated in the task of coordinating our technical know-how? We owe it to succeeding generations to be considerate of their needs and be conservative with how we use what our good earth provides. Economy ingredient number 11. An economy built around long-term flexible planning, but based on short-term investment recovery and short-term financing where borrowing is unavoidable. It is all too easy to sit down after supper with a head full of bright ideas, take a pencil and paper, and all those potentialities and dream up all the elements of a heartbreaking bankruptcy. Many successful companies got started in a garage or a basement and grew up progressively step by step. This is not a glamorous or a spectacular way to begin, but it is a sure way because it is economically sound. There are many hidden, unforeseeable booby traps connected with enterprise, and they must be dealt with as they are discovered. Some of these can be quite expensive, while others can be very time-consuming. If growth is pushed too fast, these traps can become too much to handle, and all goes down the drain in confusion and in panic expenditures. This means on-time delivery, good quality, and integrity, not just idle promises. Economy ingredient number 12. An economy in which all the participants are free to group themselves and associate according to their common interests, common beliefs, common ambitions, and choice of preferences. Here we must bow to the wisdom found in the ways of nature and behave in a way that is compatible within the order of our species. Progress grows out of the differences of ideas, but good fellowship and contentment are found in the comfort of similarities. Here we are talking about something that must be self-regulating if the economic structure of a society is to be sound and workable. It was a sad day for our beloved nation when manipulators within our governing system got the idea of demoralizing our national spirit of cooperative effort by legislating and forcing unnatural social policies. What better way could be found to cloud the vision of our populace as to what is really going on than to cause distraction by bickering and fighting among ourselves over controversial, emotional issues of social differences? We have all been used and used. The strategy of distraction is a favorite and quite effective tactic of the conquering manipulators overthrowing our government from the inside. They will toss some of their own to the wolves from time to time just to distract us and divert suspicion away from the ones behind the plot. How about Watergate and the Nixon resignation, the Agnew resignation? How about the FAA investigation and the CIA investigation? How about renewal of the Kennedy assassination incident? How about the integration and racial balance hassle? How about the busing in school textbook flap? How about the Community Development Act of 1974? This is where our wealthy and generous federal government tosses out a few million dollars in communities so they can fight over how to spend it. This is a very underhanded trick. Since the manipulators are in control of the mass communications media, all these things are given national publicity and slanted so we will think we are well informed and everything is going to work out just fine. All that is needed is better federal control and regulations, they say. Just to round out their smorgasbord of distraction, they also provide an ever-increasing menu of sports and other spectacular entertainment just to take care of those who are not so fascinated with political activities or national crises. Now, my dear fellow American, I'm going to speak to you in first person for the next few minutes 
to discuss things that are just between the two of us. First, let me offer my humble apology if I have acted like a bigot or a smart aleck and talked down to you. This was not my intention. I love you as a fellow American, even if you are a stinker once in a while. I guess we all are sometimes. Oh, you're not? Well, bless your heart. When I began my journey through this life in search of truth for survival and contentment, the state of Arizona was only one year old, and there was no federal income tax. President Taft was in office at the time. My father attended the Oklahoma Territory land grab in covered wagon in 1889. The only grandfather I knew had been a sharpshooter in the Civil War, and I remember him telling me that the bureaucrats would ruin the country someday. So I have been searching for the truth for almost one-third of our national history and have seen many national triumphs and disasters. If there was any way I could better express to you the seriousness of our national peril at this moment, I would do it even if I had to be nasty and insulting to do it. I would not want to have to do it that way, but I would because what you think of me is unimportant in comparison to the responsibility and obligation that I have toward the future security and prosperity of the children of our nation who must take over the legacy we leave for them. I have two beautiful great-grandchildren, and I ponder their future very thoughtfully. There are a number of true patriots dedicated to doing what I am also trying to do, but we are like pitiful voices in the night, not heard by the sleeping populace. Nevertheless, we must do what we can. The natural optimism common to human nature keeps us from wanting to think about liniment unless we are bruised and hurt. Then we want a remedy and fast. So there is a chance, if the good Lord is willing, that our efforts may catch on in time to help break our national fall. The plot is so fantastic that people refuse to believe that our own government could be overthrown from the inside and that we the people could be overrun, conquered, and enslaved by our own federal government. But this is what is happening. Their manipulations have been in process for quite some years, back through the Roosevelt administration and before, and they are not fooling around. They are cunning, ruthless, and thorough, guided by the evil obsession of lust for power with no regard whatsoever for human rights or human life. They want this big, beautiful nation of ours to squeeze the blood out of however they please, and they want us for their slaves. Do you wonder that I feel very strongly about our pitiful addiction to a false way of life? There are a few patriotic souls left within the structure of our federal government, but they are so outnumbered that they are helpless. Massive public opinion, I had better say very strong massive public opinion, could spoil the takeover plan. But how can we generate that kind of public power in our inflated false economy? when people are so addicted to the fake prosperity that they fear to even think it might not be genuine and lasting. I believe, though, that the keen minds of our youth sense that they are not finding the truth, and I believe this accounts for their seeking to find some kind of an answer in turning to drugs, loud rhythmical noise, I can't exactly call it music, weird psychedelic lights, and unusual moral behavior. They are bound to be searching and not finding. The reorganization necessary to rebuild our economy is going to require a temporary stepping down to gain a sound footing. But this will be only temporary and is much better than trying to go on up than falling all the way down. We stand at the threshold of the greatest age in known history, but will not be able to step across this threshold with our present footing. If our addiction is too strong to break, then the great potential that lies waiting will never be realized. Do we sell our souls for another federal fix, or do we accept the truth of reality, stand up and say no to the manipulating pushers of federal drugs? Sure, we're creatures of habit. We have to be. But there are two classes of habits, good and bad. Which do we choose? We must look at the consequences and make our choice now, N-O-W, now. Reward of discipline or the terminal reward of addiction. The manipulators could declare a national emergency, then martial law, and take us over right now. 
They have manipulated emergency federal powers into law that would allow such a maneuver to be done legally. It is my opinion, however, that they will not do it this way. I believe they are so sure it can be done with their new Constitution and new order of federalism that they will do it that way. Otherwise, it would be a little bit messy because they have not yet been able to relieve the population of its firearms. I am thankful that we still have this small deterrent in our favor. There is a lot more of hard information available on details of the takeover manipulations, but this is all that can be put into a one-hour message. Thank you for your patient attention. Please do whatever you feel you should. God bless you. Tom Wilson